For me, I've worked in this area for 40 years, and um, I've learned a bit. Um, when you look at the brain, and the brain's the target for all drugs of abuse, and unfortunately for us, um, you opioid pain medications are and have been, become drugs of abuse. We look at the surface of the brain, we see gyri, and um, there are a couple of observations here. The first would be, you know, how long does it take for the brain to become fully gyrified? And that answer is um, gender specific. So in a female brain is fully gyrified by um, the age of 21. And for the male brain, it's uh, probably never um, developed. But um, scientists do say at about 27 or 28. And most of the drug abuse interaction with developing brain is predicated on how long does it take for the brain to develop and whether drugs taken in adolescence uh, insinuate themselves and cause changes that are much different just based on the fact that the brain is still developing. For all drugs of abuse, they have one thing in common and we've changed the definition so what is a drug of abuse? A drug of abuse is actually defined as something that's self-administered in laboratory animals, typically rats, non-human primates, and they're even human self-administration laboratories. That self-administration is avid. It's an acquired drive that um, continues and could continue to death. The best death examples are, of course, you take 100 animals and divide them into two groups and 50 get cocaine and 50 get um, opioids. The 50 on opioids self-administer them but end up on a maintenance program. And the 50 on cocaine hit the lever, hit the lever, hit the lever and actually die by the end of 30 days. The opioid animals are alive and the cocaine animals are not. All drugs of abuse, if you stick a micropipette in the nucleus accumbens, which will be shown here, the dopamine rich cell body uh, area from the ventral tegmental area through, here we go, the nucleus accumbens. We stick an electrode, an animal hits a lever, gets the drug, and dopamine's released in the nucleus accumbens. Every drug of abuse is like that. And then the effect goes mesiocortical and then frontal, so that the frontal effects would be shown here in the next slide, but affect things like judgment, affect things like motivation, and part of the problem in, in addiction and in drug of abuse research is to explain why is it that a person can't calculate the risk of cigarette smoking or can't calculate the risk of continued use. And that is because the systems that are, are involved and essential for um, motivation and decision making are compromised. Drugs of abuse cause pleasure. And actually, I got interested in drugs of abuse as a proxy measure uh, for pleasure and for pleasure system. I also worked in food and sex, which are harder to study. And again, in our brain here, um, we have a sad fact, which is the area of the brain that we study for drugs of abuse is quite primitive, is the most primitive. And we, call, we say it's phylogenetically stable, meaning that the pleasure system, in essence, is the same from rats to non-human primates to humans. And so with all of this great cortex, we can't and we don't have effective inhibition for the drives that are acquired early in life. And that's, that's the, the, the bottom line understanding of, uh, in addiction. And also, by the way, the pathway that inhibits this system and comes backward doesn't develop until very late in adolescence, if at all.